Chapter Four of Bushido, The Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in November two thousand and nine. Bushido, The Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Four. Courage, the spirit of daring and bearing. Courage was scarcely deemed worthy to be counted among virtues, unless it was exercised in the cause of righteousness. In his Analects, Confucius defines courage by explaining, as is often his wont, what its negative is. Perceiving what is right, he says, and doing it not, argues lack of courage. Put this epigram into a positive statement, and it runs, Courage is doing what is right. To run all kinds of hazards, to jeopardize one's self, to rush into the jaws of death, these are too often identified with valor, and in the profession of arms such rashness of conduct, what Shakespeare calls vela misbegot, is unjustly applauded, but not so in the precepts of knighthood. Death for a cause unworthy of dying for was called a dog's death. To rush into the thick of battle and to be slain in it, says a prince of Mito, is easy enough, and the merest churl is equal to the task, but he continues, it is true courage to live when it is right to live, and to die only when it is right to die. And yet the prince had not even heard of the name of Plato, who defines courage as the knowledge of things that a man should fear, and that he should not fear. A distinction which is made in the West between moral and physical courage has long been recognized among us. What samurai youth has not heard of great valor and the valor of a villain? Valor, fortitude, bravery, fearlessness, courage, being the qualities of soul which appeal most easily to juvenile minds, and which can be trained by exercise and example, were, so to speak, the most popular virtues early emulated among the youth. Stories of military exploits were repeated almost before boys left their mother's breast. Does a little booby cry for any ache? The mother scolds him in this fashion. What a coward to cry for a trifling pain! What will you do when your arm is cut off in battle? What when you are called upon to commit harakiri? We all know the pathetic fortitude of a famished little boy prince of Sendai, who in the drama is made to say to his little page, Seest thou those shiny sparrows in the nest, how their yellow beaks are opened wide, and now see, there comes their mother with worms to feed them how eagerly and happily the little ones eat. But for a samurai, when his stomach is empty, it is a disgrace to feel hunger. Anecdotes of fortitude and bravery abound in nursery tales, though stories of this kind are not by any means the only method of early imbuing the spirit with daring and fearlessness. Parents, with sternness sometimes verging on cruelty, set their children to tasks that called forth all the pluck that was in them. Bears hurled their cubs down the gorge, they said. Samurai sons were led down the steep valleys of hardship and spurred to Sisyphus-like tasks. Occasional deprivation of food or exposure to cold was considered a highly efficacious test for inuring them to endurance. Children of tender age were sent among utter strangers with some message to deliver, were made to rise before the sun and before breakfast attend to their reading exercises walking to their teacher with bare feet in the cold of winter. They frequently, once or twice a month as on the festival of a god of learning, came together in small groups and passed the night without sleep in reading aloud by turns. Pilgrimages to all sorts of uncanny places, to execution grounds, to graveyards, to houses reputed to be haunted, were favorite pastimes of the young. In the days when decapitation was public, not only were small boys sent to witness the ghastly scene, but they were made to visit alone the place in the darkness of night, and there to leave a mark of their visit on the trunkless head. Does this ultra-Spartan system of drilling the nerves strike the modern pedagogist with horror and doubt, doubt whether the tendency would not be brutalizing, nipping in the bud the tender emotions of the heart? Let us see what other concepts Bushido had of valor. The spiritual aspect of valor is evidenced by composure, calm presence of mind. Tranquility is courage in repose. It is a statical manifestation of valor, as daring deeds are a dynamical. 
a truly brave man is ever serene he is never taken by surprise nothing ruffles the equanimity of his spirit in the heat of battle he remains cool in the midst of catastrophes he keeps level his mind earthquakes do not shake him he laughs at storms we admire him as truly great who in the menacing presence of danger or death retains his self-possession who for instance can compose a poem under impending peril or hum a strain in the face of death such indulgence betraying no tremor in the writing or in the voice is taken as an infallible index of a large nature of what we call a capacious mind yo yu which far from being pressed or crowded has always room for something more it passes current among us as a piece of authentic history that as ota dokan the great builder of the castle of tokyo was pierced through with a spear his assassin knowing the poetical predilection of his victim accompanied his thrust with this couplet ah how in moments like these our heart doth grudge the light of life whereupon the expiring hero not one whit daunted by the mortal wound in his side added the lines had not in hours of peace it learned to lightly look on life there is even a sportive element in a courageous nature things which are serious to ordinary people may be but play to the valiant hence in all the warfare it was not at all rare for the parties to conflict to exchange repartee or to begin a rhetorical contest combat was not solely a matter of brute force it was as well an intellectual engagement of such character was the battle fought on the bank of the koromo river late in the eleventh century the eastern army routed its leader sadato took to flight when the pursuing general pressed him hard and called aloud it is a disgrace for a warrior to show his back to the enemy sadato reined his horse upon this the conquering chief shouted an impromptu verse torn into shreds is the warp of the cloth koromo scarcely had the words escaped his lips when the defeated warrior undismayed completed the couplet since age has worn its threads by use yoshie whose bow had all the while been bent suddenly unstrung it and turned away leaving his prospective victim to do as he pleased when asked the reason of this strange behaviour he replied that he could not bear to put to shame one who had kept his presence of mind while hotly pursued by his enemy the sorrow which overtook antony and octavius at the death of brutus has been the general experience of brave men kenshin who fought for fourteen years with shingen when he heard of the latter's death wept aloud at the loss of the best of enemies it was this same kenshin who had set a noble example for all time in his treatment of shingen whose provinces lay in a mountainous region quite away from the sea and who had consequently depended upon the hojo provinces of the tokaido for salt the hojo prince wishing to weaken him although not openly at war with him had cut off from shingen all traffic in this important article kenshin hearing of his enemy's dilemma and able to obtain his salt from the coast of his own dominions wrote shingen that in his opinion the hojo lord had committed a very mean act and that although he kenshin was at war with him shingen he had ordered his subjects to furnish him with plenty of salt adding i do not fight with salt but with the sword affording more than a parallel to the words of camillus we romans do not fight with gold but with iron nietzsche spoke for the samurai heart when he wrote you are to be proud of your enemy then the success of your enemy is your success also indeed valor and honor alike required that we should own as enemies in war only such as prove worthy of being friends in peace End of chapter 4